Hello, and welcome to day one of the Association of State Floodplain Managers Annual National Virtual Conference. I am the ASFPM Executive Director, Chad Verginis, and I'm delighted that you've joined, uh, decided to join us for the next three days. While I'm disappointed that I'll not be able to see old friends and new by being in person, I am thrilled that there are nearly 2,000 of you joining us from all over the United States and the world. It is my hope that every single one of you will learn something new to take back to your community, your state, your job, and that you will help ASFPM in an effort that can truly only be accomplished by all of us working together to reduce flood losses and recognize the inherent values of floodplains. For over 40 years, ASFPM has been the nation's leading voice on floodplain management issues, whether it's being managing that risk through the National Flood Insurance Program, through hazard mitigation programs, flood control, stormwater, or coastal management. We know that it isn't just a federal responsibility or job that falls entirely on one agency. Rather, it is the job of all of us at every level of government, the private sector, property owners, and the public. Even as the COVID pandemic continues, so does flooding. In fact, flooding is the nation's primary hazard, resulting in over $17 billion per year in damages. Even as we talk today, Cristobal, which became the earliest ever third named tropical storm to form in any Atlantic hurricane season in recorded history, is affecting parts of the country. And ironically, the remnants of the storm are supposed to be passing over the association office here in Madison, Wisconsin later today. Climate change is exacerbating flooding everywhere, especially in our urban areas, and compounding that is sea level rise on our coasts. Although the problems are big, our toolbox to address flooding issues is even bigger. To accomplish our mission of flood loss reduction, ASFPM works to improve our nation's policies, undertakes applied research, develop and provide tools to floodplain managers, raise the level of expertise and professionalism through the Certified Floodplain Manager Program, and educating everyone about the peril of flooding and how to become more resilient to it. Our dedicated volunteers and staff work towards a more resilient and just tomorrow. We partner with other organizations focusing on codes, standards, emergency management, the environment, housing, and social justice, and ultimately, I believe that we can prevail through perseverance and hard work. For those of you that are attending the conference today, I say thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your talent and dedication to a worthwhile cause. I hope the next three days will not only provide you the practical knowledge to do your jobs better, but will reinvigorate your spirit with a hopefulness that can reduce flood losses in the nation. This morning, it is my honor to moderate our first plenary session, Flood Challenges and Solutions, Everything is Bigger in Texas. Typically, our first plenary session is focused on our host state or region. And while we cannot be directly in Fort Worth, we can all learn some uh, about some of the challenges, but more importantly, advances that have occurred in Texas over the past several years. But before I go to our speakers, I would like to introduce the plenary session sponsor, AECOM. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, ASFPM. Um, it's great to be with everybody today. I am Doug Belmo. I'm a flood risk manager working in the North American Water Business Line at AECOM. John? And hey, good morning. I'm John Dorman. I'm a disaster risk manager working in the disaster resilient services with AECOM. We're uh, very proud of the projects you just saw played on the video. Um, they're making a real difference in the communities that they serve. 
Uh, today, um, rather than sort of a traditional ad, um, John and I thought what we would do is a little bit of compare and contrast between flood risk management and disaster risk management. So this is really just to kind of get you thinking about the similarities and the challenges that all risk managers face. I'll start by reminding people that the general risk management cycle is really pretty similar across various hazards and risks. It's independent of those risks itself. It starts with hazard identification. We're all very familiar with that, drawing flood maps. It moves to the uh, risk assessment portion where those hazards are buttered up against things of value and we can estimate damages and consequences associated with those hazards. It then moves to a very important phase, which is to communicate those, those hazards and risks um, to people who are exposed, especially those who may be at more risk than others. And then it proceeds to essentially a planned development phase where um, we identify where we develop plans to manage the risk over time and we then implement those plans. And then finally, there's a monitor and adjustment phase. Uh, like any plan, um, it's subject to change. Uh, so you've got to pay attention to, to changing technologies, changing hazards, changing risks over time. And so it's not really super linear, um, but it is pretty common among all risk managers, whether they're flood managers or emergency managers. John? Well, so uh, I'm going to talk about somewhat of the pandemic. And so with pandemic, hazard identification and risk assessment are really very difficult challenges, um, different than flooding. Um, it's an invisible hazard. As you can imagine, testing is a key part of this uh, assessment. And uh, rather than uh, water experts that are doing H&H &H across the country, uh, the nation is really looking at epidemiologists and health experts to help us understand the vulnerabilities and risk. And as you know, the uncertainties like flood are high with uh, COVID, and so are the uh, consequences, which makes risk communication, which is a part of that risk management cycle, so much more important during a pandemic. Yeah, in some ways, I think COVID makes the first few elements of that risk management cycle look pretty easy um, compared to flood. You know, we've come a long way in terms of identifying hazards and quantifying risks, uh, and we're getting much, much better at communicating those risks. But I think we still have a pretty long way to go in terms of um, getting people to act against, those, uh, against that information, whether it's avoiding risks altogether or reducing them or, or transferring them through insurance mechanisms and other means, um, or really truly accepting them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure uh, from what Doug says, you, you've been tracking uh, the communications on COVID. Hopefully each one of you have been doing some of those mitigating strategies, washing your hands, wearing a mask, avoiding areas of lots of people or, or bad circulation. It's interesting, though, that many of the people are following what the experts are saying, but like flooding, not everyone sees the risk the same and not everyone responds to the risk, even though they see it the same. And just like flooding, um, one person's how they act would impact uh, lots of others. Exactly, and I think Chad said it pretty well. We're, we've got to work on these risks together. Um, you know, in the area of flooding, if you choose not to evacuate, sometimes people think, well, that's just a risk I'm taking personally. But in fact, if you later need to be rescued, you're putting first responders at risk. So. We all share in managing risks, uh, particularly flood risks, particularly the risks associated with this virus. So we need to keep working together to manage them. And, and not to be forgotten about, because this is very important, and that is the monitoring and adjustment phase of risk management. Um, this is so important because it really is probably the single skill that separates a great risk manager from a, from a good risk manager. Great risk managers learn and adjust as they go. And, as you can imagine with the pandemic and with flooding, um, the uncertainty is a real risk. And as that risk increases and decreases, we all need to, to adjust. Exactly, I think the, the adaptation phase, I think ASFPM has demonstrated it really well, moving to a virtual environment. Uh, the same is true for managing risks. You've got a plan, but you've got to adjust along the way. Yeah, so, you know, I would just say for all of you listening, uh, as the week unfolds, just think about how ASFEM has had to adjust. And I will just personally say they've done a great job, Chad, and um, how you might be able to adjust and 
work through your risk management process in understanding these hazards, including the virus. Exactly. Think about how to apply some of the great COVID risk management practices you might have seen over the last few months. Uh, maybe try to avoid some of the ones that didn't go so well. Um, and uh, keep, keep moving forward as flood risk and floodplain managers. Oh, and don't forget, while you're, while you're here, go to our virtual booth, attend our uh, showcase, 930 to 1030 tomorrow, and check out a few of our uh, presentations. Thank All you, right. everybody. Enjoy the week. Great, thank you so much, Doug and John, uh, for those important uh, words. Next, I'd like to introduce Ricardo Pineda, Chairman of the ASFPM Board of Directors for some opening remarks. Hello, conference attendees. My name is Ricardo Pineda, and for the past year, I have served as the Chair of the Association of State Floodplain Managers. In my free time, I work as a supervising civil engineers with the California Department of Water Resources in Sacramento in the Division of Flood Management. I consider myself a water geek because I enjoy hiking in the headwaters of river systems, especially the Tuolumne River and the Merced River in Yosemite National Parks. I enjoy working on river management in California's Great Central Valley, rafting and paddling whenever possible, and observing firsthand destructive lack of water management in Honduras, Central America. Over the next three days, you will get a good dose of information overload. You will hear about flood risk policy, how we, how we can improve the National Flood Insurance Program, river restoration projects, flood mapping, both one-dimensional and two-dimensional, dam safety and dam inundation mapping, levee issues, and the full range of pre and post flood hazard mitigation. When you go home to your communities, collaborate with your peers and connect the dots to other elements of water planning and management. You will see the benefits of networking within and outside your normal work groups. Over the past year, Mother Nature has once again reminded us not only who is in charge, but why the work we do in ASFPM is so important. Hurricane Barry caused flooding in Louisiana and Arkansas. Hurricane Dorian hammered the Bahamas, but spared the U.S. mainland. Hurricane Imelda caused extensive flooding in Texas, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Oklahoma, and over $5 billion in flood damages. The Lower Missouri River and Upper Missouri River system suffered flooding and levee failures as the Midwest continues to experience an extraordinary wet period. The Bonnie Carey Spillway on the Mississippi River, upstream of New Orleans, was opened three times in the last year and a half for a record number of days, and the diversion of high flows out of the Mississippi River resulted in the massive death of marine life. On May 19th and May 20th, Edenville and Sanford Dams on the Titabawassee River in Michigan failed after five inches of rain in 48 hours. It has been a busy year. It has also been a busy year on the policy front. The NFIP was extended multiple times. NFIP reform bills in the House and Senate have been drafted but not passed. The Water Resources Development Act of 2020 is under development in the House and Senate and the House Select Committee on the climate crisis is developing their important report. Unfortunately, we have seen a weakening of the Clean Water Act. ASFPM is highlighting the nation's flood mapping and flood mitigation programs with increased implementation of nature-based solutions, flood data needs, including a true nationwide NOAA Atlas 14 program and the need everywhere to leverage the federal government's expertise and provide more technical assistance to our communities and tribal nations. Our challenge for the coming year and years to come is to provide guidance to our states and communities on the best strategies to protect our towns and cities, both urban and rural, in a cost-effective manner that protects the natural and beneficial functions of floodplains. We need to improve our state dam safety program. We need to reauthorize the National Flood Insurance Program in a manner that ensures its long-term fiscal integrity. Congress needs to pass a thoughtful Water Resources Development Act that implements nature-based solutions wherever possible. 
FEMA needs to implement a strong BRIC grant program that truly results in our communities becoming more resilient to natural disasters. As a former h and modeler, we need to utilize our modeling and computing capabilities to develop advisory flood maps beyond the 100 year event. We need to develop levee failure flood maps, dam failure inundation maps, coastal flooding maps that incorporate sea level rise, urban drainage flood maps, and make these maps publicly available in easy to use web-based and app-based platforms. The apps need to estimate quantified flood risk for property in addition to depth of flooding and flood water travel time where appropriate. These analysis are already available on a limited basis from some state agencies and from the private sector. Our goal should be to make a Zillow-like flood risk application available within five years. It can be done and the product can drive smarter development. Finally, as floodplain managers, we need to adopt an integrated approach to flood risk reduction. We need to understand how flood risk planning connects with other hazards like forest fires. We need to understand how flood risk management affects water quality, water supply, power generation, river ecology, and recreation. When you return home, investigate if your community or region has developed an integrated regional water management plan that includes a robust floodplain management component. Enjoy the conference and thank you very much. In the late summer of 2017, Hurricane Harvey made landfall on the Texas coast, which turned out to be one of the most impactful storms in US history. Uh, there was wind and storm surge around Corpus Christi and Port Aransas. There was record rainfall in and around Houston and Beaumont, totaling over 50 inches in some areas. Uh, but as Texas responded to this storm, unlike other storms, they emerged from the eye of this storm uh, in a much more flood resilient way at a state level. So my talk is going to trace this uh, this response and this policy development process from a researcher's perspective. Um, I'm going to talk about why this storm was different and led to such sweeping change. Uh, what the process was from my perspective and what some of the outcomes from a policy perspective uh, came about during the 86 Texas legislative session. So Hurricane Harvey, um, this is the iconic photo uh, of flooding in the streets and a huge area was flooded across the upper Texas coast, uh, causing uh, lots of damage. For example, uh, in terms of federal payouts, uh, there was close to $16 billion between NFIP and individual assistance and public assistance payouts. Uh, overall estimates of damage hover around $125 billion. Uh, that puts it as uh, one of the most impactful storms, uh, not just in Texas history, but in the U.S. Uh, this is a, a bar chart of uh, insurance, federal insurance claims just in Texas from 1972 to 2017. And you see in 2001, uh, Tropical Storm Allison was at that time the granddaddy of all storms. And then we experienced Ike in 08 and Harvey in terms of its uh, financial impact is literally breaking the scale. So the first uh, unique part of this storm is the amount of economic loss and property damage it caused. Uh, the second factor was its size. This was an enormous storm, over 41,000 square miles uh, were under an emergent a disaster declaration. Uh, that's the equivalent of Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island combined. Uh, it covered almost every major city in Texas uh, and went several counties deep off the coast. This is a graph of just showing the extent of the damage. This is a million points of loss. 
across a landscape, uh, a very large area. The third uh, aspect of the storm is it didn't stand alone in time. For many, particularly around Houston, this was the third time in three years they experienced damaging flood events. So it came on the heels of 2015, 2016 storms. Uh, and I think looking back, this was a tipping point that resulted in more sweeping uh, and impactful policy uh, implementation. So the other set of unique characteristics was the leadership response. Uh, what happened was the governor appointed a sole commissioner uh, to, as, uh, to head the uh, uh, commission to rebuild Texas, which was responsible for formulating a response. And that sole commissioner was the chancellor of the Texas A&M system. Uh, the chancellor then did something very unique. Uh, the chancellor, instead of uh, sourcing out the report to consulting firms or other government agencies, he looked inward at his own expertise uh, and marshaled different people within the university, professors, thought leaders in the field, uh, to formulate and lead this response. And that was my job, uh, which was to uh, come up with a framework for mitigation, do all the data analytics, uh, generate uh, recommendations around uh, mitigation for the state to consider. Uh, and it brought me as a professor much closer to uh, the policy action and implementation, closer to change uh, than we've ever been before. Uh, so the first thing that my group did, and they, it wasn't just me, I was surrounded by smarter people, younger and older. Uh, they gave me uh, literally 30 seconds to write down a list of people I wanted to invite. Uh, one of those was the great Chad Berginis uh, at ASFPM who flew down from uh, Wisconsin in our first meeting and ASFPM's materials were instrumental in developing this framework. Uh, we brought together in all a group of about 25 uh, to 30 people to work on this response. And the first question we were tasked to answer is, what do we do about this from a mitigation perspective? Um, and that's where we came up with this framework, which was uh, categorized into four different dimensions. Uh, the first is avoid get out of the way. The second is accommodate, let it flood, which is somewhat of a foreign concept for people who aren't used to living with water instead of fighting against it. Uh, they're more comfortable with resistance, uh, that is stand and fight, and that dominates the history of flood mitigation in the United States. And then finally, communication, telling the story of risk. And of all of these, these four categories contain specific mitigation techniques that can be implemented uh, starting at the state down to the local level. Uh, we found that communication was the um, perhaps one of the most important but underemphasized component of our framework. And that influenced the way we responded uh, in our parts of the report and what happened in terms of the, the legislation that came out of it. So in addition to the framework, uh, we uh, did all the data analytics uh, for the report and to make sure that what we were doing was enduring and had a wider reach, we created uh, several what we called web dashboards. The same data we used to uh, analyze data for the report and to advise the state agencies on the extent of the impact and, the, and responses to it, we put up for anybody with an internet connection uh, to see. And we did a, several iterations. Some were aimed at decision makers, some were residents. Our kind of foundational dashboard, uh, we call it dashboard one, um, you can find on resilient-texas.com. And once you identify your, your user category, are you a homeowner or a researcher, it'll provide information uh, customized for what we think that user would want to see and in which order. 
Uh, but anybody who gets on this free site can put in at a zip code level um, their, their zip code or put an address and choose different layers and start to see the overall impact of the storm and do some analytics of the data itself. And here I've got uh, market uh, insurance market penetration statistics uh, across different flood zones uh, across this large study area. We couldn't provide individual information. We had to uh, aggregate it up to, in this case, zip code. The storm was so far reaching that uh, that still gave us a lot of data to present. We also uh, started a, another communication tool we call Buyers Beware, W-H-E-R-E, -E, and that website um, is now buyersbeware.com. Uh, and we started with just one county in Texas uh, with the expectation that we wanted to provide information on risk to someone who is purchasing a home or selling a home. So it's considered Zillow meets risk. Why can you see your school ratings in Zillow and your crime statistics on Trulia, but you don't know your flood risk or your hurricane risk or your air pollution risk? And we did this um, alongside the I the storm uh, report writing uh, as an unfunded service tool, and it went viral. And we've now since expanded that to I think six cities across the United States, and we're poised to um, build upon, improve buyers beware interface, uh, which if you click on a parcel looks like this, where you get customized scores per hazard and also uh, a composite score. We're going to extend this to the 41 county. Uh, Harvey impacted area in the coming years and improve upon the interface and the data. But it was this kind of communication of risk uh, that we saw as really important uh, moving forward to better prepare Texans, decision makers, and residents uh, for future storms that are undoubtedly going to strike the Texas coast. In addition to providing risk information, the system then has you click on your, your hazard shield and it'll tell you what you can do about it. Um, knowing that uh, this isn't meant to dissuade people from buying homes or uh, changing property values, but that it'll provide another layer of information so that a homeowner can walk into their purchase with wide, eyes wide open and know what they need to do or can do to mitigate the risk. Again, to communicate this rather than write a book we have bullet points uh, because that's what people uh, have the tolerance to read uh, and that's what they want. They don't want a dissertation on flood mitigation techniques. So we did the data analytics. We wrote the framework and explained what the different options are uh, in terms of specific techniques. Uh, and we developed these uh, communication tools, visualization tools out of the data uh, and then wrote uh, several recommendations which contributed to 44 recommendations that were delivered to the state legislature uh, uh, in last year. And this is where the story gets from, from really positive to remarkable. Usually um, reports like this, after action reports, uh, tend to be written, presented, and not implemented to the degree to which the authors would have hoped. In this case, because of the leadership of the chancellor and those around him and all the other conditions I described in the beginning of this talk, 43 of the 44 uh, recommendations were addressed by the state legislature. And at the bottom, so at the bottom, you could see in terms of the categories that the bills fell into, the highest was communication. The second was planning. Uh, those are the the major um, uh, the, the major things that were not being looked at in our minds when we did the uh, flood mitigation framework. And so the the Texas legislative session and the lawmakers they stepped up to the challenge and they made uh, they passed some of the most stringent, impactful, and innovative policies uh, for flood mitigation in the entire United States. So a couple of my favorites that came out, um, and I suppose my favorites are the ones that we contributed most to, uh, 
or that the, the state um, created a program and funded it, a directive to um, implement watershed level planning. And that those, uh, I think the next speaker is gonna, gonna address this in more specifically. They carved the state up into watersheds and are uh, incentivizing and funding and structuring specific watershed flood planning initiatives. And that's um, underway. Uh, another one is something that I'm really proud of. Uh, Texas uh, passed the most stringent uh, seller's disclosure uh, notice for residential properties around flooding in the country. Uh, and the Buyers Beware platform was the first start of that. We're going to improve the, the Buyers Beware platform so that um, there's more information on it, particularly around flooding to meet that state mandate. Uh, but it's not just uh, saying, hey, I'm in the floodplain or I'm not. It's have you flooded in the past? Are you in a flood pool? Are you in a 500 year floodplain? Are you in a reservoir? Are you downstream from a reservoir? Uh, that kind of risk disclosure we think is super important. And the fact that it was embraced at the state level in Texas is a really good sign. Uh, another one was um, uh, uh, funding of uh, overall flood planning and mitigation projects and infrastructure projects. So a large part of the uh, federal money is being devoted towards proactive mitigation measures, both structural and non-structural, which I think will make the state more resilient in the future. And um, also a uh, stronger, more impactful, comprehensive state flood plan is uh, underway. And that's being led by the Texas Division of Emergency Management, and I've met the person in charge of that, and it's going to be wonderful. A couple more highlights. Uh, Texas A&M uh, was uh, the obvious recipient to lead this initiative because it's a state uh, public institution that also contains a lot of the state agencies around extension. So there's AgriLife and the Forest Service, and now the Division of Emergency Management, and the directive coming out of this response was that in the future, uh, the state will use A&M and its extension agents as a force extender is what they call it. Essentially relying on these um, agencies that are already on the ground, have local connections, um, are, are serving the public and the communities. They're gonna be charged and activated during the time of disaster. And then finally, um, during this whole uh, process, when I uh, went up to College Station with our maps uh, and our web dashboards, uh, it seemed to be really helpful. And uh, we got the comments back, we should be doing this all the time. And I thought, yeah, that'd be great. We need a center for flood risk reduction that focuses on data analytics and, and visualization to help support the state. And that gained traction and ended up being passed uh, at the state level as the Institute for a Disaster Resilient Texas. And that was then um, approved by the Texas A&M Board of Regents just a week and a half ago, uh, so that it's just becoming official. And the goal of this institute is to uh, develop analytic tools, uh, let's say create an anal a spinning analytical top that throws off specific uh, techniques and problem solving approaches to support uh, state emergency and floodplain managers. And we're gonna do that using web-based and visualization and communication tools. Um, the idea is that this institution is not uh, about engagement or advocacy. It's, it's a data-driven organization that partners with other organizations around the state doing engagement and outreach uh, to help deliver the tools, the techniques uh, that come out of the institute work. Uh, this is a AM institute, but it's going to have really strong ties to University of Texas, Rice University, other universities around the state, um, and will cross many disciplines and different departments. The core of the institute, the, the core project is going to be what people are calling TDIS the Texas Disaster Information System. And that's modeled off of other amazing initiatives around the country, like uh, the University of Iowa Flood 
uh, information system and other systems in North Carolina, et cetera, uh, where Texas will bring together all of this data uh, in a way and, and employ uh, the cyber infrastructure and artificial intelligence techniques to create an integrated system to help state agencies prepare for and cope with uh, these storms, which we think are going to get more frequent and stronger in the future. And uh, we're at the very beginning stages of doing that. The Institute doesn't have a logo website yet, but we're working on that. Um, we're in the infancy of creating something from the bottom up. And I, and I, the last thing I want to say is um, we've been thinking about this approach for a long time. And it's part of a, a larger initiative that I, I think can be scaled up to other parts of the country. And that is how to t use universities and their analytical power to better close the gap between knowledge and action. So as a researcher, I'm on the knowledge side trying to problem solve. Um, and oftentimes our scholarly work and our technical reports stop short at being converted into action. And the idea is to move this gap closer uh, and harness the power of the universities. And that's a trend that is um, increasing across this country. And I think Texas um, and the university systems in Texas can be a model for how to do this in other places. You can't just jump from knowledge to action. As a professor, I can't um, go to the state house and uh, every day and you know, talk about how to implement policy or advocate for a certain approach. Uh, we have other jobs to do. So what are the segues uh, between that knowledge to action um, transformation? There are four things. First is the data analytics. Second is uh, visualizing that data so that people cannot see it, understand it, uh, get their minds around it. The third is not just visualizing it, but communicating it in a way that is interpretable, effective, that can potentially change perceptions and behavior. And then above all, uh, the fourth component of this, the segue, um, is learning. Learning that starts uh, early, often, and ongoing throughout the process. Uh, that means we produce the best flood risk prediction maps possible. That's not enough. We need to go into the communities and work with the decision makers and ask them, why is this wrong? How can we improve this? It, are these maps useful? Are they interpretable? Uh, and then go back to the drawing board, recalibrate our methods and models, and then go back again uh, to the community. So it's a cyc cyclical process. I really think this is the way to innovate for change, um, particularly around flood resiliency. It's the main, the segue is where the Institute will sit, hopefully. Um, with the overarching goal of how can we best add value with our all the universities and the technical knowledge um, in terms of really helping solve the problems because those problems are being magnified as we increase our development in coastal areas, as future environmental and climatological conditions continue to change. These problems are becoming more paramount uh, and need to be addressed with the best and most innovative minds in America. And those are usually sitting in universities and colleges. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much for including me in this plenary session. Uh, and I hope to have the opportunity to answer any questions live when our session begins next week. Thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Sam. And please remember uh, to type your questions in the Q&A box as you think of them. And if you like a question that's being asked, please remember to click that you like it. That will elevate the question higher in the queue and increase the likelihood that it will be asked. Now for our second presentation. Our second presenter is Ms. Kathleen Jackson, who was appointed by the Governor Perry and reappointed by Governor Abbott as a member of the Texas Water Development Board. Well, thank you very much. It's an um, absolute honor and a privilege to be here today and to have the opportunity to speak with 
uh, state floodplain administrators from across our nation. And of course, there's a very special place in my heart for the uh, floodplain administrators here in Texas, because a lot of what we're going to talk about today, they have been engaged in, they've had their boots on the ground, so to speak, and have been involved in the formulation of what will be, we hope, our first ever state flood plan, and also the resources that go along with it to start implementing some of the things that we need to do to mitigate floods. So thank you for your leadership, thank you for your commitment, and for the ongoing work that's going to be so necessary as we move forward uh, in this process. Um, just to talk very quickly about the Texas Water Development Board, uh, as you know, Texas is a state that is in perpetual drought punctuated by times of flood. And so we were, um, 50 years ago, leadership from across uh, Texas came together and they said, we'll never, ever, ever let this happen again. We'll never let Texas run out of water. And so they formed the Texas Water Development Board and charged the board with what I kind of think about as, as three very important things. First of all, we are the data repository for all water data for Texas. So important that the decisions that we made are data and science driven. Uh, we are charged with uh, putting together the uh, state water plan. Uh, it is a bottom-up process. Another way of saying that is that nobody tells Texans what to do. We basically have uh, 16 regional water planning groups across the across Texas. Uh, they represent agriculture, big cities, small communities, manufacturing. They all come together and they say, what do we have today? What do we need for the future? And what are those strategies or projects that will get us there? We take those 16 regional plans and we put them together and they become the state water plan. I think as we move forward and you kind of see what our vision is for state flood planning, you'll see a process that's very similar. And that is basically, it's a bottom-up process. Um, we believe local communities know best in terms of formulating the plan, and also uh, an important part in moving forward with implementing that plan. So you can have the money and you can have the technology, but it's up to that local leadership that steps forward and moves these important projects forward. So we are the data repository for all water data for Texas. We're also a bank. Uh, we have money to loan, right? here at home you won't get a better interest rate than anywhere with it than the Texas Water Development Board and to date we have funded nearly 30 billion dollars in grants and loans for water supply projects and are very excited about moving forward and in uh, and, and working on those projects that will help communities to mitigate flood and then lastly we're a technical resource we can not engineer the project for you but our folks have seen things, they can um, share thoughts and ideas, they can refer you to people who've done a similar type project. So a very important role that I feel like that the Water Development Board has over the years. And why do we do that? Uh, th this is a picture of, of, of our children. And uh, I, I believe in my heart, it's so important that that we, we take on this responsibility because we want to make sure that our children and our children's children have the water that they need. Our children and our children's children uh, hopefully won't have to worry about flood. They'll know that you know, leadership came together, we put together a plan, and we utilized the resources of the state, of the federal government, kind of promoted those synergies and were able to move forward and hopefully mitigate those concerns so that they can have the quality of life that I think as parents we all want our children to have. Uh, we were very honored and um, uh, really very excited that the um, the 19th uh, Texas legislature passed sweeping a sweeping set of laws to create uh, Texas's first ever regional and state flood planning process. And uh, we not only got funding to move forward with the first ever state flood plan, but I think they had a tremendous vision in recognizing that we couldn't wait for the flood plan to be in place, that we needed to also you know, take, take funding and utilize that to go in and start mitigating, uh, putting projects together, working with local communities, putting together uh, a regional watershed plans and be able to address and help communities to kind of make those decisions based on good data and good information in terms of how they can move forward and mitigate risk. So uh, nearly $1.4 billion worth of funding of that, about 47 million will be used in the planning process. Uh, some of that will come directly to the board and that's the 793 million that I wanna talk about in more detail, the flood infrastructure fund, and then also um, move forward and talk a little bit about the planning process. Um, one of the things that I think is, is uh, 
a big part of our success is the approach that we take in Texas, which is, is data-driven, and we believe that, again, data drives our science-based approach. Um, LIDAR is believed to be um, the most important data set for that science-based uh, approach. And to me, it's really interesting in how uh, this whole LIDAR process works. Um, they're literally, as the plane flies across the terrain, there are hundreds of thousands of laser pulses that are sent out per second in near infrared range. The light pulses strike the ground, they're reflected back up, and then a sensor on the plane captures the reflections and the distance is calculated based on how much time it takes the pulse to return. So very, um, very good and very uh, accurate point by point locating for all three dimensions for elevation data. So uh, a very important part of our data set and very fortunate that within the Texas Water Development Board, the Texas Natural Resources Information System exists to be the manager of all of this data throughout throughout Texas. And of course, if you've met Richard Wade, uh, who is our director of that, you'll know that he is energized and you know a great help to anybody that wants to move forward and, and utilize that data and information. Um, I truly believe, and I guess as the engineer on the board, that the better the data, the better the science, the better the science, the better the policy. And a big part of, I think, what uh, we kind of committed to do in moving forward with our uh, flood planning effort was providing uh, supporting data for the planning process. And also it would be helpful, I think it'll be helpful for communities in terms of utilizing it, again, to, to develop those, those projects and determine you know, what level of risk do I wanna to mitigate to. So uh, we, we've elected uh, to, to utilize base level engineering. And um, the way that of course works is, um, you, you utilize LIDAR, which is, is basically kind of figuring out, if you will, kind of the shape of the bowl or the shape of the, of the watershed. Um, hydrology, which is, you know, how much water is going into the bowl. And we know that, you know, we have now have the Atlas 14 data available and that needs to, to be incorporated into it. And then how much water is going to move once it gets into the bowl of the hydraulics. So we, we put all of these things together and we come out with, um, with, a, with a flood map that um, is, is really going to be the foundation for all of our mapping activities um, and will it be available to the public based on based on uh, after completion of this so we're committed to having a hundred percent of Texas uh, covered uh, within the next five years and then as we know it's important to continue to update this information uh, as we move forward wouldn't it be great if we could have all this information in one place and the answer is that it will be. Uh, we're very fortunate in that. Uh, I'm, a I'm a big believer that uh, strong, strong outcomes begin with strong partners, and that's very much the case here. Um, we currently um, have a partnership that was um, uh, established through FEMA Region 6 between Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Louisiana. Uh, very, very fortunate that, that Region 6 took the lead on this effort to move forward and to create um, this base flood elevation uh, viewer. Uh, the, the terminology is called here, it's called INFORM. And uh, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very impactful viewer that will enable people um, to come in, uh, floodplain managers, uh, engineers working with communities on uh, projects, uh, people who are, are moving forward in the flood planning process to, to, to get the information that, that they need. So they're basically, you can utilize and access the data online. It doesn't take any kind of sophisticated software. You're actually able to go out and download these data sets and utilize that within your own modeling. And then there is a, a, there is a portion of the viewer where as a, eventually as a property owner, if the BLD information is available, you can go in and actually get information about about your specific uh, property. So this, this really represents a significant improvement in the quality and coverage of flood risk data. Uh, as compared to uh, the FEMA regulatory data, it's, full, it's freely available on the web. And again, the board is committed to having 100% coverage of Texas within uh, the next five years. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, and um, you know, here we have kind of the comparison between what most people are familiar with that's available 
through, um, th through the digital FEMA flood information rate map or the firm, and then what could be made available through uh, base level engineering. And this is an actual, um, this is an actual area within Texas. It is, um, it is near Clear Spring in Guadalupe County. And so if you were to go in and actually, uh, you know, pull down the firm and say you were a developer or you were a floodplain manager and you were, uh, you were, you were planning for future flood risk or you were involved in the planning process, if uh, one of the things that you'll notice in comparing the two data sets is that the, um, of course, the image on the left shows uh, FEMA's um, firm information and the one on the right, it's a whole different uh, risk is identified uh, from a nearby stream that hadn't been uh, previously mapped at all. And uh, one of the things that the staff did after getting this information is they actually called the floodplain manager in Guadalupe County and confirmed that yes, this area did indeed flood. So uh, as you can see, this, this new data, this BLE information can be used uh, to complement um, the FEMA process in terms of moving forward and being able to develop the firm, but it also can be utilized for other, other things other than just planning. Of course, you know, moving forward and utilizing in the planning is, is something that the board uh, is, is committed to, again, 100% uh, coverage within the next five years, and something that a large part of our, of our financing uh, is going to be utilized for. In um, thinking about uh, the planning aspect, um, one of the first things that was important for us to accomplish, and we have accomplished, is um, being able to establish uh, the boundaries for the flood planning regions. And so this was done very recently. They're actually going to be 15 pl flood planning region. You can go out on our website and you can get a detailed map. And if you will kind of find yourself, if you're in Texas, where you sit in the flood planning regions, um, we're, 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 we've completed the administrative uh, flood planning rules. And we're moving on now to kind of like the next step in the process, which, which is to accept nominations. They're due by July 2nd to, if you will, kind of staff up these first 15 uh, flood planning groups. Uh, that's gonna be about 180 people. So uh, if you know someone who would be, uh, an, uh, if you will, kind of an ideal candidate, and in our mind, the ideal candidate will have experienced and a continued strong interest in working cooperatively on public issues, be committed to and possess expertise in flood related issues be strongly affiliated and endorsed by an interest category for which they're nominated and be capable of playing a leadership role in regional flood planning. So uh, we're encouraging folks to, uh, to nominate those. We're also looking for entities that can serve as a, uh, as a sponsor for the group moving forward. Uh, it must be a political subdivision uh, and defined as either a county, a city, or other uh, body politic under the state. So uh, moving forward, and the board is very excited about, uh, about establishing, uh, if you will, this first ever uh, group of, of flood planning members um, to be able to move forward and, and do this, this very exciting uh, first phase of the flood planning process. Um, looking on the flood infrastructure side, so that we have the planning side, and then we talked about kind of that one-two punch and what would be uh, provided and has been provided for the legislature in terms of initial funding. I think um, it, you can go out on our website. It's very similar if you're familiar with how uh, we do the uh, state revolving fund. Uh, we have what's called an intended use plan. And so there is a flood intended use plan. There are actually four categories. And I think these reflect what we feel like is very important moving forward in, in terms of being able to focus. Certainly what we've heard from communities and stakeholder input from across the state is how important it is to have uh, watershed planning to do that in the, in the, in the beginning. Uh, we know that many communities um, literally have um, very little, if none at all. And so uh, category one was established again to encourage utilization of the fifth. Uh, there is a, a very lucrative grant component to this category, and uh, we encourage uh, communities again to come in and 
and apply for, for any one of these four categories. And uh, very quickly, we envision uh, projects moving forward through category two or planning that might be need, needed to be done for flood planning projects. Uh, we see the value in matching uh, federal funds. So often we hear that there's a community, particularly a small community that has received federal funds but needs that federal match. And so there is a category within FIF uh, directed towards um, being able to secure, if you will, that local match. And then category four, uh, making sure that those measures, whether it is early warning systems, um, some of the things that we particularly have heard from um, from our floodplain managers who often sometimes serve also in the emergency management um, role that crossing barriers are needed. So, so things that will uh, auto, almost immediately affect protecting life and property in category four. So again, lots more detail can be uh, found out about, uh, you know, what, is it, what are the uh, things that you need to do and how you can go out and actually submit, if you will, um, a, uh, uh, an application to be considered for this funding. So kind of looking at moving forward and what does that funding cycle look like? Um, it's a, it's a two-step process. Um, we are first act asking for a, a bridged application, which is a very short application. Uh, the board will then take those and prioritize those and then reach out to those entities that, um, that we want to offer uh, funding to and ask them to fill out a full application. That full application will look very similar to the applications that, um, that we, we ask for those who come in and, and currently work with the board. Uh, obviously, this is not our money. This is the statement that state's money this bel belongs to and has been entrusted by taxpayers and property owners and, and the public from across the state of Texas. So we want to make sure that, uh, you know, the engineering, the financial, the legal, and the, uh, and the environmental have been, very, have been very thoroughly thought out and have been considered. Uh, if there is, um, you know, a planning effort, uh, would definitely encourage you to, to consider that. One of the things that we did specify is that um, the hydro hydrologic unit uh, in code be an eight a HUC ten? Um, again, the 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 breadth of the planning area again to encourage uh, collaborative work amongst all of the entities, uh, as well as um, coming together and planning together to make sure that we're not uh, you know something that someone does upstream doesn't unintentionally. Um, impact somebody who is who is downstream. So moving forward, uh, the board will uh, consider the applications, and then we're expecting to put out uh, financial uh, commitments or offer financial commitments as early as this as this fall. Um, another, uh, I, I think, important element moving forward, and something that we were charged with is. Um, you know, of course, what we know is that there are, you know, six, at least six state, state, six state agencies and multiple uh, federal agencies who are managing programs. And we know how important it is that we, uh, that we, we, we all come together. Uh, we, we, we make sure that, that people across Texas uh, have the opportunity to um, solicit funding and be able to get, if you will, the kind of like the mat right match for their project. And so uh, some of our staff have kind of, uh, you know, we've, we've developed this flood information clearinghouse. Uh, they've kind of termed it as uh, a match.com for flood projects. And so what I would encourage you to do is to go out and, and you know, take a look at this on our website. Um, kind of the best way to use this site is to request, um, put in a submit uh, request for information form. It's not an application, but, uh, and you don't need a technical consultant. It's, uh, it's just the bare minimum type of information. And then we in turn can get back with you and point you towards those areas that might be a good fit for funding. Again, trying to optimize uh, both state and federal dollars for uh, communities across the state. And this is very much a joint effort. I think one of the successes in uh, so far in moving forward in, uh, in, our, in our flood initiative has been uh, the collaborative effort between the Texas Department of Emergency Management, the Texas General Land Office, the Texas Department of Agriculture, the Texas Soil and Conservation Board, and then of course, um, the Texas Water Development Board. Um, 
in talking with the group, and of course, you know, you're, you're extremely talented in all that you do, uh, I would just encourage you to continue to be champions for regional collaboration. Uh, in the Eye of the Storm report, after Hurricane Harvey, uh, Governor Abbott challenged Texans to future-proof our state. And what this, this means is that we really don't know what's coming. We don't know whether it's a flood, we don't know if it's a drought, but what we need to be is we need to be prepared. And we need to draw on the talent and the resources of, of people you know, across many different um, agencies, across many different communities and come together and, and put this in place. Um, we definitely know that um, resiliency means uh, and neighbors, you know, upstream and downstream working together. But I think more than anything, and 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 in the, in the direction that I think we've we've gotten from uh, from stakeholders, from um, from the work that we've uh, we've done across the state in soliciting stakeholder input, as well as the comments that we've gotten moving forward with both the funding element and the planning element, is that we can't do things like we did in the past. We can't kind of wipe, you know, an area floods and we go in and we, we put in infrastructure or we put in whether it's structural or non-structural so that it, it doesn't, you know, that area with under those same conditions doesn't flood again. We've got to be more forward looking. We've got to look at things that, that will impact our future growth and we need to ask this, those, those hard questions. What can we do in order to promote resiliency? What can we do again to future-proof our state? So in terms of, you know, what's coming up, and what's uh, ahead of us and some of the, of the key things to kind of be aware of. Again, those fifth abridged applications are due June 15th. So get those abridged applications in if you're within Texas to kind of, you know, get in the game, so to speak. And then, um, you know, consider, you know, nominating or, or if you know someone who would be uh, a good representative on our flood, uh, initial flood planning regional groups, uh, please offer up their names. Um, and also if there's a political subdivision who would be a good sponsor, we'd appreciate hearing about that. Um, late summer, uh, we anticipate uh, considering approval of uh, the prioritization for the fifth projects and then uh, moving forward with uh, some financial assistance for, uh, for the fifth and for funding these um, uh, important initiatives uh, sometime in the fall. Um, you want, we, we want to stay in, in contact. We want to kind of keep up with you. And so, you know, stay in contact with us, stay in touch. Uh, you can go out on our website, um, kind of look for flood and then click on the little mailbox on the top. And uh, that will um, give you an opportunity if you want to, you know, if something's new and you want to hear, you know, be notified about that, you can certainly sign up for those, those type of, of, of notifications. Uh, again, I just wanted to Thank you, um, floodplain administrators, uh, for your leadership. Thank you for your commitment. Thank you for what you're doing for communities across our nation and for communities here in Texas. I mean, we are, I believe, I truly believe we are where we are today because of your input, because of your leadership, and because of your engagement. And it, it's just so wonderful knowing that moving forward, uh, we're going to have your talent, we're going to have your boots on the grounds experience to help us. And so uh, we are not um, a, a regulatory uh, agency. We exist to be a resource. Uh, I bring you greetings from our other two board members, Peter Lake, who serves in the financing slot. He's our chairman. And Brooke Pop, uh, amazing. She is an attorney, uh, came from the comptroller's office and you know, such an amazing okay. addition and such insight that she brings to the board. Um, we are, we, we exist to serve, we exist to be a resource for you. So thank you for your work so far. And please know that anything and everything that we can do as a Texas Water Development Board, please reach out and please make us a part of, of, of your future as, as you are a part of our future. Thank you very much, Kathleen. And it sounds like some, there's, there's some great things happening there in Texas. Our final pre presenter is Kevin Schunk, the local floodplain administrator for the city of Austin, Texas. Hi, everybody. I hope you guys do, are doing well out there. I appreciate you guys being here and listening to us talk about floodplain management. I wish that we are all in the same room to talk about floodplain management to share ideas and swap stories, but we're not. I'm in Austin and you are either at your office 
or at your home listening to this presentation. And I appreciate you guys being a part of it. And a huge kudos goes out to ASFPM for continuing on with this virtual conference so that we can share these ideas and swap stories. I'm gonna start off with a little geography lesson. So Fort Worth, Texas is in North Central Texas. Austin, Texas is about 200 miles south of Fort Worth in Central Texas. And I'm not sure if we have all 50 states represented here today, but you guys are out there somewhere and you're listening to us talk about floodplain management and I greatly appreciate that. So I graduated from high school about 10 miles east of Fort Worth in a town called Arlington. So I have some, a pretty good idea of some of the wonderful things that Fort Worth has to offer. One of my favorites is the annual Fort Worth Stock Show and Rodeo. This event happened in the, at the end of January this year. So even if we were in Fort Worth, we would have missed it. Um, but it's an annual event and I like to go to it when I can, did get there this year. Um, my favorite thing at the stock show and rodeo is the rodeo itself. And my favorite event at the rodeo is the bull riding. Have you ever seen this bull riding? These cowboys get on top of 2000 pound animals while they're kicking and spinning, trying to get to that minimum eight second buzzer. It's an amazing event. And if you've ever, ever watched bull riding on TV, which I have, then you'll hear that the commentators give a scattering report of the bulls. They'll say things like, this is Bandit, and he likes to turn to the right. Well, the cowboy knows that Bandit likes to turn to the right too. And the cowboy uses that information in order for him to be successful at riding Bandit to that minimum eight second bell. In the same way, we as floodplain managers use information in order for us to be successful. And success to us is making our communities more flood resilient. I'm going to talk to you today about three things that the city of Boston is doing to make our community more flood resilient. Those things include using the best available data to minimize flood risks, providing the best available flood risk information to our community, and using technology to identify flood risk throughout Austin. The first one is using the best available data to protect our community from flood risk. And the example I have for this is some recent changes in predicted rainfall for Texas in general. Let's just assume that you have a bucket and you have bought a certain size of bucket to hold a certain amount of water. And you've had this bucket for years and it's been doing a great job. And sometimes it gets about halfway filled, sometimes it fills all the way up, but the bucket holds the amount of water that you want it to hold. It's done a great job of holding that amount of water. Yet, someone comes along and says, well, you know that amount of water that you wanted to hold in your bucket, it's now much more likely to occur. And the amount of water that you need to hold in that bucket is now a lot more water. So what's going to happen to your bucket? That's right. It's going to overfill, overflow. So the bucket in this example is, is, is an analogy for the creeks and storm drain systems within our community. And not just within Austin, but many other communities in Texas and across the nation are seeing increases in the amount of rainfall that increase our flood risk within our communities. Here's an example of the Atlas 14 data. Atlas 14, of course, is the rainfall study that was completed by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. The draft report for Texas came out in January 2018, and the final report came out in September of 2019. In this map, we see green and we see brown. This is a comparison between the Atlas 14 100 year 24 hour rainfall depth to the previous federal rainfall study, TP40, which was done in 1961. So wherever you see green on this map, that's where Atlas 14 is predicting higher rainfall depths for that 100 year 24 hour storm. So as you can see, 
Central Texas in general is greatly impacted by these rainfall changes. Specifically for the city of Boston, we're seeing some drastic changes in our rainfall predictions. Both the 25 year, 100 year, and 500 year events, as well as others in other directions as well, are seeing a significant increase in the rainfall depth. The 500 year alone is seeing up to a 44% increase from 13 and a half to 19 and a half inches in the 24 hour period. What this is doing for the city of Boston is it is changing our understanding of flood risk entirely. It's putting more houses in the floodplain. It's putting more roads in the floodplain. And that flood risk is gonna be seen more frequently by our community. So when this data came out, we knew that we had to make some changes and, 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 and educate the community of the, of the city of Boston about these changes so, so they then, that they can understand their flood risk. So the steps we took were, we hired a consultant to review the Atlas 14 data and recommend to us changes we should make to our drainage criteria manual. That's the manual that we and the community and developers use to design drainage infrastructure. And we, we wanted to make sure that the drainage infrastructure was being designed with the best available data possible. Concurrent with that process, staff came up with proposed floodplain regulations based upon the Atlas 14 information. After we got the draft of that, those regulations complete, we went on an outreach campaign, significant outreach campaign. Over the course of a year and a half, we had more than 100 meetings, meetings with city council members, meetings with residents, meetings with neighborhood groups and professional associations talking about our new understanding of flood risk and how that may impact them. That process led us up to November 14th, 2019, when the city council approved the most significant changes to our floodplain regulations in their 37 year history. That was a major milestone for us, but we, did, we knew we weren't gonna stop there. After it was approved, we needed to do more outreach to our community to make sure that people understand their flood risk. We sent out more than 80,000 postcards to property owners and tenants in or near the floodplain to educate them about flood risk and the fact that these uh, regulations were just approved. That process it was a significant process and very time consuming but it was a way that we, it was the only way that we felt that we needed, we could move forward with this information and move, move forward with floodplain management uh, regulation changes. So two changes in the regulations that I wanted to point out were, we changed the definition of the 100 year floodplain to be the current effective FEMA 500 year floodplain. And the reason we did this because when we looked at the, at the Atlas 14 data, we identified that the new 100 year rainfall depth was very similar to the current FEMA 500 year rainfall depth. And so since they were similar, and since we had information, floodplain maps and floodplain models of that 500 year floodplain, we wanted to use the information to regulate development within our community. So that definition of the new 100 year floodplain is the current effective FEMA 500 year floodplain. That definition is going to be in place until we get finished with our process of updating all the floodplain maps in the entire city of Austin. That process is gonna take probably two to three years to complete. At the end of that process, we will have an idea of what the new Atlas 14 100, 100 year floodplain looks like. And then we will be regulating to that. The other significant change in our regulations was we increase our freeboard amount from one foot overall in general to two feet. Adding that one foot of freeboard to new buildings that are within the floodplain is a significant step to building resiliency within our community. The next thing I wanna talk about is how we provide the best available flood risk information to our community. Flood risk identification and outreach is a significant part of our floodplain management program 
and it's something that we pursue year annually in order to get the word out about flood risk. The way we do this is with our online floodplain information tool called FloodPro. We developed Flood Pro in 2013. Since that time, it has gone through significant changes to provide even more information to our community. The nice thing about Flood Pro is that in an automated way, it provides information that used to be done manually by staff. So staff does not have to manually produce that information. Therefore, we can spend more time doing other floodplain management activities. One thing that Flood Pro does is it finds floodplain information by address. So you type in an address, Flood Pro, Flood Pro will deliver to you the FEMA floodplain information, as well as the City of Boston regulatory floodplain information. That information is very useful for developers, residents, developers who are designing projects, residents who may be purchasing flood insurance or just want to know more about their flood risk to their home. In addition to the floodplain information, Flood Pro prints floodplain maps, and that shows the property in relation to the floodplain itself. Very important tool to have a visual impact of what the what the uh, what the impacts of the floodplain are to that property itself. These floodplain maps show the, can show the Austin regulatory floodplains or the FEMA floodplains. We have a lot of floodplain models and storm drain models within the city of Boston. That information is very useful for developers and designers who are designing developments within our community. And we get a lot of requests for that information. Again, used to be manually done by staff. Now Flood Pro can deliver that information automatically at the request of the developer. Those floodplain models and floodplain data includes not just the hydraulic and hydrologic models, but includes the GIS information that was used to build those models, all using flood from. In, in addition to those elements, flood pro delivers elevation certificate data if we have an elevation certificate for a particular property. A resident can download the actual elevation certificate and use the finished floor elevation in, to, to assist them in their flood insurance uh, outlook. Flood Pro has been a fantastic tool for us, and it is a way to automate processes that used to be done manually by staff. We have heard lots of things from our residents and, our, and the development community that they like to have the information at their fingertips, and they can download the, information, the models and information automatically to use for their, for their developments. The last thing I want to talk about is the City of Boston's use of technology to inform our flood risk reduction program. And this is, this is keying in on identifying local flood risk that is not on a floodplain map. Local flood risk goes by many names. Some people call it urban flooding, where streets become rivers and those rivers reach houses. Some people call it chronic flooding, but as you can see from this picture, the significant flood depths can be achieved during, as, as part of this flooding. In the city of Boston, we call it local flooding. Local flooding occurs from storm drains, not from creeks themselves. My least favorite name, but one that I've heard before, is nuisance flooding. Because actually, as you can see from this picture, this is anything but a nuisance. This type of flooding causes significant stressors to our community, even more so on communities of color and low income communities. So if a resident goes to Flood Pro, types in their address, and then they look on the map and they realize, oh, I'm not in a floodplain at all. I have no flood risk to worry about. That is a common scenario that's happening within the city of Boston. Yet, during big rainstorm events, we do get flooding along the storm drain system. And we have flooding reports that, that this flooding is happening 
more and more often. If we then build a polygon around this area and say in this area of town, we have a significant number of flooding reports. Let's analyze the, that data to try to find out where that flooding is coming from. If we put that project area on a floodplain map, we can see that it's not near a creek. We can then put our, uh, superimpose our storm drain system and the flooding reports within that polygon, and we can identify where the storm drain system is located and where the flooding complaints, complaints are being reported. Yet we need more information than this. We know that we want more information from this to help us design a flood risk reduction project to minimize flood risk in this community. We have more than 1,100 miles of storm drain in the city of Austin. So we needed a way of identifying where the flood risk is for this, this, this area. So with the use of 2D model technology, we are building models that show us on the ground, on maps, where that flood risk exists. So instead of just looking at the storm drain system, we're able to turn on the flood risk and we're able to determine which buildings are, are impacted by that flooding. This information is extremely helpful for us in designing projects to reduce flood risk. Like I said, we have 1,100 miles of storm drain within the city of Boston. Almost 90% of that, we have one-dimensional storm cab models completed. That information is very helpful to us to understand the capacity of the pipes of the drainage system, but that does not help us in identifying the flood risk overall because it does not identify the overflow or uh, the on the ground flooding. That's why we have used the models, InnoVise models, InfoWorks ICM to analyze two-dimensional two models to analyze where that flood risk exists. And that's what the picture that you're seeing in front of you. In this part of town where there is a significant uh, storm drain system, we now understand exactly where that flood risk is. This has been a significant effort for us over the years. And we have been working on it for a number of years and we're only at 4% of the storm drain system that's modeled with 2D software. So we have a long way to go, we know that. But we're pursuing this process and refining it as we go along to provide us vital flood point information as we design these projects. We're using the, the technology of the 2D models to help us reduce our flood risk across the entire city. So the things we talked about today was Austin's use of the best available data to protect Austin from, from flood risk. The example used was the Atlas 14 data. We talked about providing the best available data to the community about flood risk. We do that through FloodPro. And we talked about the, the Austin's use of technology, 2D models, to inform our flood risk reduction program in order to design projects to reduce that are reducing flood risk. These three things as a program together are helping us reduce the flood risk in Austin and making us a more flood resilient community. Thank you guys very much and I appreciate you listening. Great, thank you so much, Kevin. And just a great presentation on the good things that are going on in the city of Austin. Okay, now let's get to the questions and answers. Um, and the first question that we have is from Kathy and, and Sam, this one's for you. Did you get pushback from realtors or builders on the Buyers Beware website? Kathy, I get that question all the time. Um, and surprisingly, because uh, I was warned this would happen, I'd say 99% of the feedback I get is positive. Both seller uh, and buyers seem to really want this information. We're, we're providing really basic government produced, uh, somewhat conservative risk information. And I think um, there's been a lot of interest in transparency uh, around the real estate transaction process. And I think that's why the, the state was easily able to uh, um, adopt what is the most stringent uh, real estate risk disclosure law for floods in the country. 
I do get a lot of negative feedback when the site goes down. Um, I get a lot of emails. Uh, we're, last time I checked, we were getting about 30,000 hits a month and none of this was expected. Um, the, the Texas Division of Emergency Management uh, is um, contracting with us to improve and expand the site. So my hope is we provide even better information um, but still make it simple and understandable. Uh, but surprisingly, uh, and sometimes it's disappointing to people, very, very few negative comments. The only ones that I've really gotten and engaged with people on is um, the real estate appraisers uh, who don't want, you know, want the distortion of information out there, but um, that's a real rare occurrence. Sounds like it's very successful. Kathleen, this next question is for you uh, from Mary Carson. And how will the watershed planning effort interact with FEMA flood mapping? Will it work in tandem, such as expanding existing floodplain management standards to include new high-risk zones identified through those watershed plans? Well, Chad, thanks so much for this question, because I think it really kind of embodies something that um, the board really thought about and quite frankly as we traveled around Texas and we talked with stakeholders when we were doing our first ever state flood assessment uh, it was it was part of the feedback that we got from people quite frankly all over the state and they felt like that we needed we needed better mapping uh, we needed better mapping uh, quite frankly so that as leadership they would be empowered with the tools to make better decisions and so I think our vision from the very beginning, was to move forward and put in place uh, through watershed planning, through um, better, uh, better data that local communities could have to make the decisions that they needed to be able to mitigate flood. And, and, and the thought was always that this would complement what we're doing for the FEMA process. But if you will, make the information available sooner in the process. So it's kind of like you get the best of both worlds. You get the watershed planning uh, that where communities are coming together. They're asking that question, um, you know, is what I'm doing inadvertently help, you know, impacting somebody downstream? Uh, and let's, let's take a look at that plan and let's do it in a way that it benefits everyone. Uh, we're having that sophisticated data that we know we need um, you know, better data than we've ever had before uh, through the BLE and through the Atlas 14 to help us not only through the planning process, but also to make that data available to communities quickly so that they can, you know, their leadership can come together and, and, and take a look at what's out there and make those decisions that they made in term, determine what level of risk they want to mitigate to and the projects that they're going to move forward with in, in terms to, to be able to mitigate that risk. So uh, the short answer is, I think we're doing both, uh, that the intent of the watershed planning was to have communities come together, work collaboratively, and then the same information and the same uh, science and data that we're putting together can also benefit uh, the, the FEMA process, the FEMA mapping process. And, and Kathleen, that, that sounds so critical um, that essentially what we're talking about science-based decision-making and couldn't agree with you more. Um, Kevin, the next question uh, is for you from Randall. And Randall is curious, does Austin do a LOMAR to update the FEMA flood maps to match the city floodplain maps? So as a, uh, the result of our floodplain studies is new floodplain information. That's both regulatory floodplains that we use for internal purposes, and that's also a new FEMA floodplain. So at the conclusion of the study, we do talk with FEMA, either do a physical map change or a letter map provision according to their schedule and, 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 and funding to make sure that that updated FEMA map does get included on the flood insurance rate map. It may not be, it's not gonna be the, the, the local regulatory map, but it's going to be the FEMA map produced by that study. Okay, great. And um, and maybe a quick question for all three of you as the as the final question. And um, Mitch was asking this in the context, I think, of your presentation, Kevin. But I'd ask all three of you to answer this in a in in a, in a short aspect, uh, given given the times that we're in right now. 
Um, the data that you're using or developing, whether um, in, in your respective presentations, how do you, um, uh, how is that data either focusing or how could you anticipate it focusing on equity or social justice initiatives around flood risk reduction? And Sam, maybe I'll start with you. Yeah, that's a, that's a critical issue in everything we do. Uh, we're, we're pushing beyond engineering-based analysis, incorporating a lot of artificial intelligence methods and machine learning. And that means incorporating socioeconomic data uh, and social vulnerability data. And so in the future, um, the data is changing every day. In the future, we're hoping to, when we, particularly when we identify flood risk, we, we account for some of these socioeconomic variables and uh, environmental justice variables uh, as a layer as we do so. Um, that's really important. Um, and it's important to be transparent with what's going on. It's gonna depend what kind of question we wanna answer. Uh, but I think that given the data streams and the future of our methods um, and ability to analyze, uh, there's gonna be a lot more of, of um, social justice incorporated in what we do. Great, thank you, Sam. Kathleen? Well, I think kind of um, moving forward and kind of looking at, you know, what our long-term intent is of what we are accomplishing. Uh, it's got to be more than just, if you will, the engineering fix and the steel and the pipe or, or, or even those type of mitigations that are non-structural. It also has to be a culture. I mean, people have to recognize that there are things that we can do to protect communities against you know, the, the impact of flood, but a lot of that responsibility kind of falls to you as an individual to take care of your family and your loved ones. And I think having that understanding and, and incorporating that into the culture of what we do, whether it's how we move forward and we, uh, we institute the type of structural changes that we know we're gonna make, as well as a key element being the, the type of, of mitigation that would come through education as well as um, the early warning system. So I think incorporating you know, all facets of what we're dealing with today. And again, the, the better information that we have, the better decisions that we can make and the better long-term type of mitigation efforts. And I think sometimes we think that it's just that, you know, it's that reservoir, it's that holding basin, but it's also how people respond and, and come together and, and protect one another. So very much important moving forward. And I think uh, it, it's, it's actually an important element and something that uh, quite frankly, um, we feel like it's important to consider. And I, and I feel like that the partners that we work with uh, see it in, in a similar way. Thank you. Kevin. So what I would say is that with our current floodplain study process that we have starting now is to restudy all the floodplains in the entire city. What the most important thing that's going to come out of that, and both Director Jackson and Dr. Brody mentioned this, was how we communicate that information to our residents and to make sure that we're reaching all the residents. And, and in particular, we have not maybe not done such, such a great job in the past of reaching communities of color and low income communities. So that's gonna be a focus of our process is to how to identify, not just identify, but also communicate that risk to our entire community. Great, thank you. And thank you so much to all three of you for your wonderful presentations. And now I wanna turn it over to our conference and events planner, uh, Sarah Waller for some closing uh, logistics and comments. Yeah, thanks, Chad. Um, and thank you uh, to Kathleen, Kevin, and Sam for being here for our first plenary. Um, this is very exciting for us. Um, we've been working hard over the last month to do this pivot, as they call it, um, to a virtual conference. And so um, thank you all for being here to, to attend the conference today. And we're, as you know, this is new for all of us. So we're working through a few of those bugs here real quick. But thanks for joining on. And we're excited to bring you three full days of content. Um, so I also want to thank, give a big thank you 
you to our conference sponsors for their uh, pivot in supporting us in this virtual platform. Um, we really could not do this without them, could not be put, giving you this content. So just wanted to give a big thank you to all of our conference sponsors. One big way that you guys can thank them as attendees is by checking out our virtual exhibit booth. Um, they have all created some really cool virtual booths that you'll definitely want to check out. A lot of great features. Some of them are doing fun giveaways and you'll even be able to chat with them um, through typing and also even some face-to-face -face meetings. So head on over to the virtual exhibit hall. Um, it will be open at all times, but we will definitely have people in those booths uh, during the breaks between sessions. So go grab a quick snack during this break, um, but make sure you go check out the exhibit hall during the break as well. Um, a few uh, question, logistical questions we've seen come up is, how will I earn my CECs? So with that, um, as long as you spend, if you spend 12 hours active in this conference platform this week, a minimum of 12 hours, of course, you can spend all the hours in the platform if you want. But as long as you spend 12 in the platform, you will automatically receive 12 CECs to your account. Um, if you cannot spend 12 hours this week, you will be able to watch, come back and watch sessions on demand and we'll be sharing more information about how to earn the CECs that way. But if you're planning on being here and attending um, throughout the week uh, for at least 12 hours, you will automatically get those 12 CECs. Um, and also uh, we'll be having a, um, a fun trivia night, uh, both tonight and tomorrow. We know um, at our normal in-person conference that we love interacting with each other and having fun. And so we decided to do um, both a trivia night tonight and tomorrow night. And um, you can find that information over on the main landing page of the platform. Um, and then lastly, uh, hopefully we'll get these, get these uh, announcements wrapped up real quick. I just have an announcement um, from the ASFPM Foundation. Um, so after a rigorous application and selection process, the ASM, ASFPM Foundation is proud to announce their Future Leader Scholarship winner for 2020 to 2022. And it's been awarded to Elizabeth Lacey, um, who is entering her third year in the Civil Engineering Honors Program at Colorado State University. Um, so through the selection process, they learned that she lived through Hurricane Katrina. So she's seen firsthand the social and financial devastation that it was caused by this event. Her personal experience with her coursework has led her to pursue a career in floodplain management, which is really mm -hmm. exciting. Um, you can congratulate El Elizabeth directly and catch up with Jesus, our first Future Leader Scholarship recipient in the Foundation's virtual booth. Um, that will be happening tomorrow, June 10th at 1030 a.m. Um, we also encourage your attendance at the Foundation's 10th Annual Student Paper Competition, which is also tomorrow, Wednesday, June 10th at 3.30 p.m. And you'll be able to see that um, on the conference schedule. Um, so uh, they will announce the first, second, and third place finalists for that, for the Student Paper Competition at Thursday's plenary. So um, if you guys have any questions, please feel free to email conference at floods.org with any logistical questions, and I'll be able to respond to those. But uh, uh, we'll be heading to a break here, but we'll see you back um, at 1.30 for our next level of congruent sessions. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.